And now our, our next speaker is um, somebody who's an ordained pastor. Um, he's a Presbyterian. I don't hold that against him. Um, and somebody who has spoken so forcefully about transformation, about the sins of the nation. And you won't find um, a more patriotic American than I think than me, or I should say my dad. But, you know, having a prophetic voice in this country is a good thing. When I think of the, the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Nehemiah, when I think of individuals who held up the mirror to make us a better people, I think there are few people who do that as well, as rigorously or as thoughtfully as our next speaker. And I also love his life's journey. Um, I, I, I like to think of myself as a fourth rate copy of Chris Hedges. Um, because, you know, he was New York Times, you know, travel the world. And then he went and became an ordained pastor, was work in the church, his work in prison. Um, but not only is a New York Times bestseller, but he's coming out with a, a new book. And uh, I just asked Chris to just, maybe he's gonna touch on some of those themes. But I, I think, you know, we heard from legislators. We heard from Van Jones, who I think is an incredible advocate. We heard from Governor Christie. We heard from Reverend Al talking about moral courage. What I love about, and when we designed today's conference, it's starting with the values, um, understanding experience, understanding the political process. But what we have, I think, in, in Chris, um, is someone who crystallizes uh, both the challenges and the opportunities. And uh, with that, um, I think a prophetic voice um, for the sake of our country's soul, for the sake of the nation, for the sake, as Van said, of the 2.4 million people who are in prison tonight, for the things we've done right, but perhaps more importantly, the things we are doing wrong. It's my great honor to introduce Chris Hedges. Chris. Thank you, Governor. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a cause that is close to my own heart. Uh, I came back after 20 years of being overseas, mostly in war zones. Uh, and because of Al Kandel, who uh, uh, it now runs operations, but at the time was the administrator of uh, in Wagner, uh, and Celia Chazelle, who was the head of the history department at the College of New Jersey, I began teaching uh, uh, within uh, the prison system and found it deeply rewarding. I had taught uh, at Columbia and uh, as a visiting professor three times at Princeton. Um, but uh, what I found within that prison classroom uh, was, uh, I mean, without being hyperbolic, just sacred space that uh, here were students who had not had an opportunity incredibly gifted. Uh, they had uh, turned their cells into libraries uh, and uh, were serious uh, intellectuals uh, who had been uh, denied the kind of opportunities uh, that you've worked so hard now to give them that uh, NJ Step uh, through Rutgers uh, gives them. Uh, and uh, I have watched uh, amazing uh, transformation within that classroom. And I do have a new book coming out in the fall. Uh, it's called Our Class, uh, uh, Trauma and Transformation in an American Prison. Simon & Schuster will publish it. Uh, it is about the class that I taught in 2013 uh, at East Jersey State, where uh, I helped my students write a play called Caged. It was published by Haymarket later. Uh, it, was, uh, it was also, um, produced at the Passage Theater in Trenton, sold out almost every night, uh, including one very moving night, when, which was for the families of uh, the playwrights, my students. Uh, and uh, it really chronicles that process of trauma and transformation, because of course, trauma for so many people within our prison system begins before they get to the prison system. They come in traumatized. Uh, and I, my last book was uh, called America, The Farewell Tour, but it 
uh, was really rooted in uh, the uh, understanding of uh, the desires or the lusts for self-annihilation that were pioneered by the French uh, sociologist Emile Durkheim uh, in his book, Suicide. And, and Durkheim asked himself, what is it that drives groups and individuals to carry out acts of self-destruction, uh, self-annihilation? And he uh, pinpointed this uh, rupture of social bonds. That's where we get the term anime, uh, people who are pushed outside the system. Uh, and so that all of the ways that they can actualize themselves, find a place, find dignity within the social structure are denied to them. And they uh, essentially affirm themselves through destructive acts, uh, which is something, by the way, I saw in Gaza. I was the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. Uh, Gaza, you can't get in and out. Uh, many people call it the world's largest open air prison. Uh, you have people in incredible poverty. You have young men tend to a room on a floor. They can't get a job. Uh, they have no income. They therefore can't get married. Uh, and there is this huge push uh, to become a shaheed or a martyr, uh, often in the case, uh, in those cases, through suicide bombing. Uh, that was a very extreme example, but one that I think is worth looking at within our own urban centers, where all of the manufacturing, of course, has been uh, offshored. I uh, wrote a book a few years ago with a cartoonist, Joe Sacco, called Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. It was written out of the poorest pockets of the United States states, uh, these sacrifice zones, these places that capitalism has sacrificed, uh, and of now, of course, we're watching them sacrifice the entire planet. And one of those chapters was out of uh, Camden, New Jersey. Uh, Camden, New Jersey was a uh, hundred years ago, a huge manufacturing center. Our RCA was there, uh, porcelain, there was a huge porcelain company, uh, of course, Campbell Soup, uh, which still has a headquarters, but they don't make soup there. Uh, and now uh, the population is cut in half. Uh, and, uh, and essentially what, what we see in these urban centers is that inability uh, to uh, actualize yourself, to find a place, uh, to uh, be integrated within the society. And, and, and that produces this kind of anime. So in my last book, uh, America, The Farewell Tour, uh, coming out of Durkheim, I looked at all of those self-destructive pathologies that ripple across the United States, the opioid crisis, uh, alcoholism, gambling. I wrote uh, the chapter on gambling out of the Trump uh, Taj before it closed. Uh, and uh, um, suicide, of course, the highest rates of suicide are among uh, white, uh, middle-aged men. I don't think that's accidental. There's a brilliant essay by James Baldwin, where he talks about how uh, 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 African Americans who understand, who grow up understanding that the system is gained against them, are less susceptible to that midlife crisis and that despair. Uh, but white Americans are taught to believe the myth uh, of American uh, meritocracy and uh, the American dream. And when it all falls flat, uh, it, it hits them in a, uh, in a kind of a, a darker and more self-destructive way. And I think that that is exactly right. Uh, one of the things Durkheim points out uh, is that uh, hate groups are an inevitable response to uh, anime or the rupture of social bonds. Uh, and he writes that uh, that's because those who seek the annihilation of others are driven by feelings of self-annihilation. So we just had an incident in New York City a hate crime carried out against an elderly Asian American woman. Uh, that person had been incarcerated uh, at the age of 19 uh, and had been warehoused in one of these uh, hotels that were turned over in essence to function as homeless shelters. Uh, and I think, I don't know his personal story, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna guess, uh, but uh, I think that we see that, uh, that when people are completely cornered uh, the, and the only way they feel they can affirm themselves is to destroy. Uh, they will. They will go down. This is a Roger Lancaster, the sociologist, calls this poisoned solidarity. Uh, and that's, uh, that is really rippling, I think, across the country. We saw it on January 6th with the people, the mob that occupied 
the capital. Uh, I think that poison solidarity is something that uh, is uh, endemic, uh, both in rural communities and urban communities. Uh, my, much of my family comes from Maine, uh, working class Maine, uh, and the communities, uh, uh, the mills are all gone. Uh, the town where my grandparents uh, were from, the, even the bank is boarded up. There's methamphetamine labs everywhere. Uh, and, 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 and what this anime does, of course, is uh, create trauma. Uh, and trauma is something that I myself have dealt with. Uh, I was uh, mostly covering conflicts uh, overseas and uh, have struggled with PTSD. Uh, and, 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 it, and at its core, trauma is about the inability to feel. It's about being numb. It's being cut off from your own humanity and the humanity of others. So many people, uh, because of the uh, rupture of those social bonds within their communities, um, because as a society, we have unfairly, I would argue, uh, thrust social control onto police. It should not be the job of police the, the primary job of police should not be social control. Social control comes through a multiplicity of ways in which people are integrated. Uh, Gramsci writes about this, Freud uh, writes about this, of course, Durkheim writes about this. Uh, and you know who writes about it quite uh, movingly is John Paul II in his encyclical on work, which I urge everyone to read. He's often touted as a very conservative cleric, but that is uh, a powerful encyclical, encyclical that just really makes the argument, I, I think quite uh, astutely that uh, work is not simply about uh, exchanging labor for a wage, uh, that work is about family. I mean, he makes the big argument that work is about family. Uh, it's about uh, being able to live within the society with dignity. Uh, and we've taken that away. Uh, we've taken that away from the working class uh, especially with the destruction of unions and deindustrialization. Uh, and, and we have relied essentially on militarized police to maintain control in these, uh, especially urban centers. Uh, and uh, because all of the other mechanisms by which people are integrated in society have fallen away, uh, these police uh, have to use very draconian tactics. They're uh, pushed into a court system where 94% uh, of the people in our prison population plea out. They had never given a jury trial uh, and they're coerced. And I, I don't think coerced is the wrong word. They're coerced to plea out the systems not designed, not just in New Jersey, but throughout the country uh, for jury trials. As Michelle Alexander has pointed out, if we actually had jury trials, uh, if everyone had a jury trial, the whole system would uh, collapse. Uh, and then of course, once they're in the system, uh, the, the, the trauma can often be uh, exacerbated. Uh, I'm, I, I, I have certainly been uh, around in war Chris, zone. Chris, can I, can I just, can I just on this one point when you talk about the, can I just ask you to expand on your phrase, and I've heard you use it before, the sticky paper of the legal system. So how people coming out of prison almost never, or it's so significantly difficult to extricate themselves from the from some aspect of the legal system. That sticky paper metaphor yeah. that was- Well, you know that as well as I do, but of course what happens is they go in and they are hit with fines, uh, thousands of dollars of fines. If you're earning $28 a month, they will pull, I think, you know, $2 or something out of it every month. But 30 years later, you can walk out and still owe a lot of money. That's number one. Number two, of course, with everything privatized, you can accrue debt within the prison. It, it, prison if you want to visit, uh, you want to make a deathbed visit or 15 minutes with, a, with an immediate family member who has died at a funeral home, you have to pay for the corrections officers and overtime that can run hundreds of dollars, often 900 or $1,000. Uh, uh, and uh, then you've got Global Tell Link, uh, you've got uh, uh, the commissary. Um, but then when you get out, you also are hit with old, uh, like, you know, parking fines. I mean, these things, uh, uh, child support. I mean, you can get out already in debt and then be hit with even more debt. So students of mine who get out immediately spend all their time rushing around uh, trying to gather money to pay off old parking tickets or speeding tickets or whatever that have accrued interest. 
So they're immediately hit with a terrible financial burden, uh, which if they don't have a, a job, they, you know, they can't pay. And if they can't pay, they, they go back in. Uh, so uh, I think that that financial, uh, that predatory financial system is, uh, and I'm glad you raised it, is, is one of the uh, worst impediments uh, because you remember, you know, many of these people come out and uh, they've been, if they've been in for a long time, uh, they've severed relationships, certainly with their community, but often with their family. Uh, just finding a place to live is exceedingly difficult. And it gets old, you know, six weeks on a couch, even, you know, at your brother's house. Uh, uh, so, yes, I think that, that, you know, there are sort of structural mechanisms within the system that we need to examine very closely, that being uh, one of them. Um, it, uh, you're I muted. I can't you, hear you. No, thanks, Chris. Can I just ask you, so if, I guess on some level I understand it, but why do we consistently make it more and more difficult for people to reintegrate into the fullness of American society? It's as, almost as if, you know, when it, it happened during uh, Democratic and Republican administrations. We talked to Van Jones earlier, the, the incident of, of the person who sells CDS or drugs and they're precluded from having general assistance, rental assistance. Why, why do you think our democracy thinks that that's a rational appropriate? It's almost as if we're making, you know, the, the climb harder and harder and harder such that you or I couldn't climb that mountain, let alone somebody coming out without the benefit of healthcare, housing, food stamps, or employment. Like, why are we in this cycle that seems to be so counterintuitive? Because people getting out of prison have been thrown into a criminal caste system where they've been demonized. I mean, Van Jones said the same thing, which is interesting. Who did? Van Jones. Yeah, well, that's right. Michelle Alexander also has made that yeah. point. And so it, it is a caste system. And these are the people that we're all allowed to, uh, to hate, uh, to fear. And so I think, and that, you know, that began a long time ago. It began uh, probably in the 1990s. Uh, that's what fueled the whole uh, omnibus crime bill and the expansion of the prison system. It was really about the demonization of the whole crack epidemic became. Uh, so, you know, if, if the issue is crack, then somehow the issue is not urban poverty, uh, failing schools, uh, you know, collapsing uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, lack of meaningful employment. You know, it, it, you, you, when, you, when you, you narrow or your focus on, on, on something, you know, like cracks the perfect example, then uh, you can ignore all of the contributing factors that lead to this kind of social uh, disintegration. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, it, I think that, that, and still we see it. I mean, I, I don't have a television, so I don't see these shows, but I hear about them in the prison uh, and they make my students very angry because my experience in a prison is two hours in a classroom reading James Baldwin. Uh, and of course, again, those kind of quote unquote reality shows that go into prisons, that two hours of sitting around discussing James Baldwin doesn't make for great TV. Uh, but uh, essentially talking about the animals in the cages uh, does. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not uh, in any way, uh, you know, naive. There are uh, people I've, I, you know, frankly, have taught a few. There are people, and that's usually a mental health issue, but there are people that should not be walking out those doors. So in that sense, I'm not an abolitionist. Um, but again, that usually is a mental health issue. Um, uh, so they're there. Uh, but they're not actually in anywhere near the majority of the prison. And in fact, there's significant numbers, especially as people age. I mean, what, the difference between Wagner and East Jersey State was very interesting for me. Wagner, they're young. Uh, they could be flippant, which I didn't like. Um, uh, but by the time I got to East Jersey State, these were men who, and I've also taught at Edna Mahan, was some pretty remarkable women, um, but these are men who, you know, they talk about aging out of crime. That's really it. Uh, you know, they, some of them, you know, usually if they're in that long, they're in for murder, uh, but they've certainly aged out of crime. Uh, and they have, uh, despite tremendous impediments, uh, really uh, carried out remarkable forms of transformation, uh, which is real. 
Uh, and one of the things that I always find so moving about my students when they get out, uh, especially if they have a long sentence, is how hard they work to make a difference within the society. You know, it's as if they're, uh, you know, they're, they're working overtime to try and make up for all of those years that they lost. Uh, I think a very remarkable student of mine, Ron Pierce, who's testified. I mean, Ron's an amazing guy. Uh, and, you know, he's not going to sugarcoat his own past. He, uh, he said that he deserved prison. I mean, he's not, uh, but he has really become, we were actually very close friends and I got a grant. He worked with me on my last book on the class. Um, so yes, the, the, and, and I think what's so heartbreaking for those of us and I'm not preaching to the choir here, who, who work in the system is to see figures like that come out and then the society just shut one door in their face uh, after another. Uh, and, uh, and, and part of that, of course, is financial. Uh, there's a student whose name I won't mention who just couldn't, he couldn't pay his fines. He got thrown back in, uh, I don't know, for a few months, and now he's living on the street. He won't even have a fixed address because he's in his 60s and, and you don't get social security. You may work 40 hours a week in a prison at a prison job, but you're not in the social security system. So he's now probably 64, or 65. He tried to work construction. You know, he, he's unemployable in many ways. Uh, and now he spends most of his time in the Newark uh, train station. Um, and so, and, and th these kinds of, uh, human stories, which, uh, you know, don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, especially I live in Princeton, especially for people who live here are just invisible. Uh, I think really are a huge indictment of the system itself. So um, how do we transform? I mean, the, the focus of your book is transformation. So, and recognizing the unique trauma done confronting individuals, how do we transform their lives, but perhaps not more importantly, but as importantly, how do we transform this prison system to move from the retribution model that Van talked about to this restorative model, from this binary, innocent, guilty model to healing persons, healing community, and rejoining community? I would say they don't get the kind of counseling they need. So I would say counseling, I mean, there's a constant cut of social workers which I think is very short-sighted. So I would say counseling and then education, 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 education. Which is the first thing to get cut. Yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, you aren't gonna reach everybody. I mean, the fact is that's just a sad reality. Um, but there are a lot of people who within the system who really do want to better their lives. And we know statistically that people who manage to get their college degree, either within the prison or if you got a 3.1, you can matriculate to Rutgers and finish, have very, very, very low recidivism rates. Uh, and so I think that, uh, and you know, Como in New York saw it and then uh, was talking about massively expanding the education system within the New York yeah. uh, prison system. And he got blowback uh, from the Republicans and conservatives and uh, and it never happened. But I think that that yes, and we we saw we saw in the Massachusetts prison system a couple decades ago where they had a massive uh, program like that. Again, I think recidivism rates were four percent. So uh, it it is about I would say those two things: helping people cope with the trauma they have, with many cases they have carried into the prison system, and giving them educational opportunities. Whether and you have done this, Governor. Uh, I mean whether that is through the, the, you know, reading Sheldon Wolin, which is what I teach, which is brutal, but brilliant. Um, <laughs> that class is still talked about at East Jersey State, um, uh, or whether it's vocational, you know, whatever it is, but, but being able to walk out the door uh, with, uh, you know, with something other than, uh, you know, 20 years of being locked in a cage how and, and not housing, having anything to show for how about, it. How about housing in prison, Chris? I mean, your sense of when we heard um, Professor Craig Haney uh, talk about the Stanford prison experiment and talking about housing in Norway and saying you dropped in, it was almost as if you would think you were in the middle of a college environment. How much does housing um, or the opportunity for a rational housing environment, how much does that impact the, the psyche of, of the person incarcerated? 
Well, there's different types of housing, as you know, in the prison. Uh, yeah. I certainly think that prolonged solitary confinement is a terrible mistake because of the psychological damage that it visits. Um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, the systems are completely antiquated. I mean, I go to Wagner, I thought I was in a James Cagney movie. I mean, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, nothing's changed uh, physically within those prisons. So yeah, I think the housing, uh, I mean, you know, we, if you go back to the 1970s uh, in New Jersey, there were all sorts of programs. I mean, there was there used to be a boxing program in East Jersey State. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Reuben Carter was in there, but yeah. you had uh, Quan McDonald, you had these, these professional, uh, they actually televised nationally. I mean, it's, uh, we yeah. had family day at East Jersey State, which got a little out of control sometimes. I actually know students who uh, uh, managed to uh, impregnate their wives or girlfriends on family day. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it, there was, uh, and, 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 you know, the, it was interesting with it because a lot of people have a long institutional memory. They still talk about the administrator from East Jersey State from the 70s. Uh, so yeah. I, I think we have to, uh, you know, that kind of law and order rhetoric, that demonization, that creation of the criminal caste uh, has uh, essentially allowed us to strip away all of the kinds of programs uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and uh, institutional support that actually make transformation possible. And it is possible. Um, and I think New Jersey is moving in the right direction. Um, uh, but, you know, New Jersey was caught up nationally in this kind of uh, decision to um, essentially strip away in the name of law and order and the demonization of the criminal class, all of those kinds of programs. And we used to have all sorts of vocational programs in the Jersey system as well. Um, I mean, imagine being able to come out as, 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 a, as an electrician or as a plumber you know, to yeah. have some kind of skill. Now you still- I, I, I know have... guys that it, they had two electric, oh, two electrician courses and they never touched a wire. So- uh, Right, right, right. It's, right. it's, it's, it's well, I would think, systems I would think are, it'd you know, be hard to be an electrician and not touch right. a wire. Right, well, that's why we can't teach, I think we can't teach chemistry or biology. You can in, every state's different. You can in California. Um, but yeah, I think that, that, you know, we want, I mean, the goal is really, that's why I'm in there. Uh, you know, uh, the goal is really to uh, help people who had nothing, because most of these people had nothing when they went in, and, uh, you know, use that experience in a positive way uh, so that when they get out, uh, they can reintegrate, that those social bonds are re-knit and they can find a place within uh, the society. And, uh, uh, and if we don't do that, uh, then, of course, there's a there's not just a personal cost for those who are in the system, but I'll go back to that incident in New York. There's a there's a horrific cost for the society itself, and of course that woman she was seriously injured, but she could have been killed. So so I mean when I talked about you as a prophetic voice and taking the long view, I mean Chris Hedges sitting today in this year of April first, twenty twenty one. Um, does America get it right within the next two years, five years? I think Biden has to get it right. I think this is our last chance. Um, and, you know, I, I think that he's moving in some directions. I think the infrastructure bill, I was not particularly thrilled with the COVID uh, ARP bill, uh, um, but we have to begin to build the kind of new deal uh, yeah, I see Bobby Kennedy there as a perfect example. We have to rebuild that kind of New Deal uh, system, which, which the business elites have been dismantling since the end of World War II, uh, because if we don't, we are going to end up with another demagogue. And we may end up with a competent demagogue uh, who, when he, and I think there's no question that if Trump could have carried out a coup d'etat, he would have. Uh, he was just disorganized and inept. Uh, so I think we have to get it right. Uh, not just. Do we get it right on criminal justice and prison reform and reentry? What's that? Do we get it right on criminal justice, prison reform, and reentry? Well, it really requires. I mean, the prison system is so bloated. Uh, I think it's forty percent or something of everybody in our prison system has 
not never been charged with physically harming another person, drugs. I mean, this kind of stuff. Uh, it's just massive. I mean, 4.4 percent of the world's prison of population with 25 percent. So, uh, uh, but again, it's a mechanism of social control because within these communities, there's nothing for these people. And you're going to get pushed into the illegal economy um, inevitably. I mean, we had, I had a student who got out. He gave birth to a, a son. The son had severe uh, medical issues. I mean, in fact, the little baby's on oxygen all the time. He couldn't get work. He started selling drugs. Uh, and he was just cornered. It's not like he wanted to. Uh, and he got picked up. And now, you know, he may go back in. So I think that that we have to um, rebuild the social infrastructure. And, you know, it really comes down to investing in people, uh, not into systems of control. Uh, and, uh, and I worry, you know, nationally that, uh, and because this just doesn't afflict uh, people within the prison system, it afflicts the entire working yeah. class and the working poor. Uh, we have to get it right now because time is running out. Trump was not some kind of freakish anomaly. Uh, remember what 74 million people voted for this guy and that was four years of lying and ineptitude and flagrant corruption and everything else uh so uh unless the ruling elites in both of the parties begin to get it right uh, and i think there is some hope with this infrastructure bill uh then yeah then i worry and and these people of course are i mean the democratic party is completely complicit in in uh the demonization of uh, the underclass, of, you know, super predators, all this kind of stuff. Biden was an architect of the 1994 omnibus crime bill and everything else. I mean, the other thing, of course, are sentences. I always tell my students, I used to cover, I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, and I used to say, you, do you know how many years uh, uh, Princip got for assassinating the Archduke, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne? He got 20. I got students who got 20 years, they didn't kill anybody. Uh, so... Yeah. Uh, I think other, the other thing is the just uh, insanely long. I, I, I love the I love the metaphor. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and the name of the book, Chris? It's called Our Class, Trauma and Transformation in an American Prison. And it uses the process of writing that play to really look at their lives and mass incarceration and, because and when, everything when in it, that play happened to someone in that classroom. And when does it come out? Who's the publisher? October 5th. And who's the publisher? Simon and Schuster. Simon and Schuster. Um, well, I, I just um, from trauma to transformation. I mean, I, I just I just so value your perspective and your ability to integrate so many distinct spheres um, in terms of your your diagnostic capacity and and God willing your prognosis and your your call. And I think I've heard this all day long. Um, which is hardening. It's so much of it's in our control if we believe in a functioning democracy and and the purpose of the republic. So I just um, I want to thank Chris for his your ministry, um, your wisdom and your intellect, but your ability uh, for what I consider in a serious sense prophecy to call us to our to our better angels. And so with that. Um, I, I just want to thank Chris Hedges. It'll be sold on Amazon and get out there and <laughs> get out there and buy the book. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Godspeed. Thank you okay, so bye. much.